Wireless data. It's what connects us to just about everything. And full power license spectrum is how it gets from point A to point B. Americans will use five times more 5G data by 2027. To make sure all Americans benefit from secure, reliable 5G networks, we need more full power license spectrum. Go to more5gspectrum.com to learn more. Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum. We range from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at the Bulwark, and I'm joined by one of our regulars, Damon Linker, who writes the Substack newsletter Notes from the Middle Ground. Linda Chavez and Bill Galston are away this week, but we are delighted to welcome three special guests. Stephen Vladek, professor at the University of Texas School of Law and author of the new book, The Shadow Docket. Bob Shrum, a longtime Democratic strategist and professor of political science at USC. And David Kramer, former assistant secretary of state and now executive director of the George W. Bush Institute. Well, I don't make it a habit to quote Vladimir Lenin, but he did say one thing that's appropriate, it seems to me, and it's this. He said, there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. And the past week, I think, qualifies as one of those. We have had two quite momentous Supreme Court opinions handed down, and we have had an attempted coup or something, and David Kramer will enlighten us as to what is going on now in Russia. So I'd like to start with the Supreme Court opinions. First, we heard from the court in the matter of Moore v. Harper, a case that people were dreading because it was attesting this theory, the independent state legislature theory that some scholars and activists had suggested meant that the wording of the constitution could mean that state legislatures acting independent of governors and very importantly, state Supreme courts could make law regarding elections. The court overturned that. So let's turn first to Steve Vladek for your view on how that case came out and what was at stake. Yeah, thanks, Mona. So I think the short version is that the Supreme Court basically refused to endorse what we might call the broadest possible vision of the independent state legislature theory, a world in which it would have been basically impossible for state Supreme Courts to ever apply state constitutions to state legislatures where federal elections were concerned and where you could have had a lot of really wacky, crazy things happen. But, and I think this is an important caveat, the court did not close the door on the Bush versus Gore scenario, on the possibility that there will be cases in which federal courts are convinced that state courts went somehow too far in enforcing their own constitutions to strike down rules imposed by the legislature. And what's so remarkable to me, Mona, about Chief Justice Roberts' majority opinion is that it quite overtly refuses to tell us where that line is and refuses to say where a state Supreme Court will be going too far and thereby run afoul of the federal elections clause and where a state Supreme Court will be doing what state Supreme Courts do all the time which is to just apply the state constitution to the state legislature. And I think the headline today is Supreme Court doesn't endorse broadest view of theory. But the headline tomorrow is, you know, we're looking at more litigation, perhaps next time in the middle of a presidential election cycle, where the Supreme Court has provided no guidance other than that there's at least some cases where this theory might work. Damon, do you see it the same way? And when you pair this with the uh, passage of the Electoral Count Act reform, doesn't it seem to you that these are sort of twin blows against Trumpist mischief regarding elections? Well, I certainly uh, was encouraged by the decision. And I do think that especially with the Electoral Count Act reform, that we've seen that these are acts to kind of 
buttress the system and to plug the holes that Trumpian chaos revealed. I mean, some people who watch these things closely may have been aware that these vulnerabilities were there, but I think a lot of the rest of us just sort of counted on things running smoothly, which they really have not. But basically, since Bush v. Gore, that was the first harbinger of it, but especially since the Trump election in 2016 and then above all 2020. As for Steve's point, I mean, I totally grant that there is a kind of open-endedness to the decision here, but I also think that to some extent that is inevitable. There are going to be cases or could be cases in which we need someone to step in. And it's also appropriate that the high court not try to prejudge what the circumstances of that case are going to be precisely because you can't anticipate that entirely. There's always going to be a little white knuckling in politics at the highest levels. There's going to be a need for prudence and judgment on the part of people with authority to try to decide when to intervene, when not to intervene, and then if you do intervene, exactly how to do so. And I know it can be unsettling to kind of have it stated quite that bluntly and open-endedly, but I do think it probably is the wisest course to simply stand back and say, for the most part, this radical uh, independent state legislature theory, that does not stand, that doesn't fly. But beyond that, if we end up in a conflict about what the right rules are, how the state laws interact with federal guidance and the Constitution, there could end up being a conflict. And we reserve the right to intervene again, uh, as we did in Bush v. Gore, much as many of us sort of, we hope that doesn't happen very often, let I'll just leave it at that. Okay, thank you for that. So it seems in the last number of years, we've been white knuckling it more frequently than perhaps any of us is comfortable with, but that is certainly the way we live now. But Steve Vladek, I'm going to come back to you because you've written this new book called The Shadow Docket. And since we're talking about the Supreme Court and we're going to come to the momentous affirmative action cases, but tell us a little bit about the topic. You called it The Shadow Docket. And you note in the book that almost 99% of the court's decisions now take place on the shadow docket. That's kind of a shocking statistic. Tell us more. Yeah, I mean, so it's a strange week to talk about the shadow docket because this is probably the one week of the year where the merits docket is actually most in the news. Right. But, you know, part of why I wrote the book is because I think a lot of us are conditioned to think about the court as the sum total of the decisions we're talking about today, as the sum total of the headline-generating rulings at the end of each term. And what we lose in the process is we lose all of the historical and technical details about how those merits decisions even come to be. We lose all of the ways in which the Supreme Court has both been given and has taken power from Congress to you know, set its own agenda to choose not just the cases the justices hear, but even the questions they're going to decide within the cases that they choose to hear. You know, the affirmative action case we're about to talk about, the court actually jumped over the federal court of appeals to hear that case. I wrote this book basically to put into context the more technical side of the Supreme Court's work for two reasons. One, because I think we just generally don't have a very good understanding of how the court operates as an institution versus, you know, the big headline generating stuff. But two, Mona, I think if you look at the court's behavior over the last five or six years, you know, one of the things that I think really makes this court different from its predecessors is not that there's a conservative majority. We've had that before. It's not that the majority is willing to go back on long settled precedents. We've had that before. Rather, it's that we have a court that is willing to use a slew of authorities, unsigned, unexplained orders, different types of procedural mechanisms, whatever the heck the justices want to, you know, get to the results that the justices want to get to. And so that means, you know, we've seen the court block immigration policies through unsigned, unexplained orders. We've seen the court block COVID mitigation policies through unsigned, unexplained orders. We saw the court not block Texas's controversial six-week abortion ban through an unsigned, unexplained order. And so, you know, to sort of tie these threads together, part of why I wrote the book is because I think all of us, not just the folks who watch the court carefully, but folks who don't and aren't even lawyers, 
I think could do well to understand better how this is actually new, how the court today really does not look anything like the court of a century ago, let alone of the founding era. If we had to have a policy debate about the role we want the Supreme Court to play, about the amount of power we want the court to have over its docket, over its agenda, over everything the justices have claimed power over, we might not answer those questions the same if we talked about the court differently. So the ambit of the book is to try to recenter how we talk about the court, to look more holistically at all the ways the court has power to affect our lives in acts other than decisions like the Moore versus Harper case Tuesday or the affirmative action cases this morning. So this practice of these unsigned and unexplained decisions have been criticized by Justice Kagan. I know. Can you enlighten us? Does it have any critics among the six Republican appointed justices or is everybody on board? Yeah. I mean, one of the most vocal critics has been Chief Justice John Roberts. So, you know, starting with the COVID cases in the fall of 2020, You actually saw Chief Justice Roberts regularly joining the three remaining Democratic appointees in dissent when the court would reach out to, say, block New York or California COVID restrictions, when the court didn't block the Texas six-week abortion ban, when the court allowed Alabama and Louisiana to use congressional district maps that lower courts had blocked and indeed that the Supreme Court just agreed were unlawful. And so, you know, Mona, one of the striking things about this uptick in the last five or six years is that it hasn't been uniformly ideological. It's been the five other conservatives in many of these cases against the chief justice and the Democratic appointees, where the chief justice's point every time he's dissented has been, hey, listen, maybe I'm sympathetic to the bottom line that, you know, you're asking us to reach. But if we're going to do that, we should do it only after full argument, you know, briefing, the whole, you know, sort of nine yards of process that we give to cases on our merits docket that, you know, emergency applications, these unsigned, unexplained orders are not the way to change the law on the ground. They're really only supposed to be these interim stop gaps. And, you know, Mona, I think it says quite a lot that John Roberts, no big fan of abortion or affirmative action or voting rights or any of these other things, is nevertheless siding with the more liberal justices over and over again in this context. It's hard to get people to care about process. Most people are outcome-based, including many members of the Supreme Court, I might add. (laughs) But process is key to our system. So thanks for writing this book. All right. With that, let us turn to this case regarding affirmative action. It was two cases, one against Harvard University, a private institution, and one against the University of North Carolina, a public institution. I'm going to turn first to you, Robert Shrum. I wonder what your feeling is about this, both substantively and your sense of the politics. Well, I think for a long time, affirmative action has been a target on the right. I found the opinion, which I read, a little strange in the sense that, and Steve can correct me on this, the chief justice begins by saying the University of North Carolina and Harvard can't do this because of the Equal Protection Clause, which actually doesn't apply to private actors. It only applies to state actors. That's not why they struck down Harvard's affirmative action. They did it under federal law. But that's the first sentence of the opinion. The second thing that strikes me as at least a little strange is exempting the military academies from the ruling on the grounds that to have a cohesive armed force, you need to have the kind of diversity that affirmative action brings. The truth is that a very high percentage of our military officers come out of ROTC programs that are conducted at universities. And by that logic, I suppose, you could have affirmative action for people who were going to enroll in ROTC. Thirdly, I think universities are going to adapt to this. One of the things that Chief Justice Roberts said was that this ruling doesn't mean that you can't look at a student's essay, an applicant's essay, where they explain how race has either led to discrimination against them or inspired them and take that into account. So I think universities will do that. And if you look at the statements, for example, of the president-elect of Harvard, the president of USC, and I'm sure this is going to happen with universities all over the country, they say 
we are going to maintain diversity. Now, there are going to be states where that's going to be difficult. I mean, I could see Florida and Ron DeSantis making sure that the University of Florida can't do this. But in a lot of other states, I think it will happen. I believe that affirmative action serves a purpose. Diversity is very important. And I hope that despite this ruling, universities find ways to continue assuring that there's a student body that, to some extent at least, reflects the society we live in. Steve Vladek, one of the things that the Chief Justice pointed out is that when you do use race as a criterion, according to the court's jurisprudence, it has to be narrowly drawn so that it does not do harm to any particular ethnic or racial group. And the court found that there was harm to other racial and ethnic groups by definition, because it's a zero sum game. You accept some people, you reject others. For example, the initial brief in this case pointed out that 19% of the admitted class to Harvard in 2013 was Asian American, but that if they had been chosen purely on the basis of merit, it would have been 43%. Yeah, I mean, I think, Mona, there's really a paradox at the heart of Chief Justice Roberts' majority opinion, which is that on the one hand, he goes out of his way, as Robert mentioned, to, you know, suggest that there are still circumstances where an applicant perhaps could talk about how race shaped their experience in their essay or their personal statement. He goes out of his way to carve out the military service academies. But Mona, that very point that you just highlighted suggests that that shouldn't be permissible either. And so, you know, one has the sense reading this decision that the chief justice wanted to effectively end race-based affirmative action without expressly doing so, without having to sort of own the mantle of overruling the court's prior decisions, especially in Grutter versus Bollinger, the Michigan case from 2003, and the two University of Texas cases. And I think the problem is that going forward now, this is going to create a little bit of a disparity on the ground where, you know, there are going to be states that allow, if not encourage, public and private universities to solicit diversity statements that, you know, I think are inconsistent with part of the chief's opinion and expressly endorsed elsewhere. And there are going to be states like where I live in Texas that are going to say, no, you can't do this at all. And so what we're going to have is not necessarily the complete end of any racial consideration in, you know, undergraduate admissions, but a very, very different way of doing it that's going to cash out differently in different states. And back to Robert's point, and that's going to apply at least for the moment, equally to public and private colleges and universities, for no other reason than because the Supreme Court is interpreting the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1964 to carry the same standard as the Constitution, That, of course, would also leave room for Congress to come back and say, actually, for private schools, we're going to have a different standard. So, you know, Mona, I think folks were expecting an opinion maybe more along the lines of Justice Thomas's concurrence, which says, no, we should just end this. We should get rid of it. We should totally put it in the, you know, in the past. And because the chief justice, you know, equivocates in the opinion, I think we're left at least with some questions going forward about what's left and how what's left is going to differ state to state. Let me pursue that just a little bit. Doesn't the military, though, get carve-outs for all kinds of things that uh, the civilian side of life doesn't because of their unique mission and because lives are at stake? They get to limit the ways that their enlistees behave and what they can consume and how they dress and how they can arrange their hair and all kinds of things that would not be appropriate in other contexts. I mean, that's certainly true. I think on the one hand, though, we've seen the court actually push back against that a little bit in the last few years. We've seen, of course, challenges to some of the military COVID vaccine mandates, where the arguments that have resonated with lower courts has been maybe the military shouldn't be different. But Mona, even then, so what about, you know, ROTC programs at, you know, non-service academies at public and private universities? Those presumably have the same justifications. Are those allowed to take race into account going forward? I think the answer would be no. So, you know, the point is not that there are no arguments for this distinction. The point is that I think there's a fair amount of confusion out there about just how far the Chief Justice's majority opinion goes because it doesn't quite bring itself to say we are forever closing the door on any consideration of race in undergraduate admissions. 
but rather leaves open the idea that there are going to be at least some circumstances where it's permissible. China is making 370% more 5G spectrum available than America. Tell Congress to restore FCC auction authority and allocate more 5G spectrum to make sure America leads the industries and innovations of the future. Go to more5gspectrum.com to learn more. Are you currently enjoying the show on the Stitcher app? Then you need to know Stitcher is going away on August 29th. Yep, going away, as in kaput, gone, dead. Rest in peace, Stitcher, and thanks for 15 years of service to the podcast community. So switch to another podcast app and follow this show there. Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Damon, this decision is probably not going to be unpopular. Looking at opinion polls, you find varieties depending on the phrasing, of course. But in one poll, 2022 from Pew, 62% of Democrats said that race and ethnicity should not be a factor in college admissions. And as you can imagine, even greater percentages of Republicans. And people give different answers to the question if you phrase it as, should there be affirmative action? Sometimes you can get majorities saying yes. But when you put it in terms of racial preferences, the support goes way down, even in some polls among African-American respondents. Yeah, I mean, African-American respondents tend to be a little higher in support, whereas other demographic groups tend to be more negative. Unless you go to kind of white Republicans, it tends not to be overwhelmingly negative. The polling shows a country that is generally suspicious of or critical of such programs while kind of recognizing grudgingly that they can be useful in some circumstances. And that's why I think when, depending on how the question is phrased, you can kind of jigger the numbers up and down a little bit. I think Americans are divided on these issues in a way that uh, I think is on the whole uh, a good thing because it shows some awareness of the complexity involved. I do think that discussion of these cases needs to keep in mind what it is we're talking about. This is about elite production. Still, fewer than half uh, of Americans graduate from a four-year college. So anytime you're talking about college, you're already talking about sort of the most privileged half of the country, roughly. But it's not much more than about half. And then the vast majority of schools are not particularly selective in who they admit. You simply fill out an application, send it in, and you get in. So, you know, it's very fitting that one of the two schools in these cases is Harvard, the most elite school in the country, widely recognized as having the best universities in the world. Now, of course, you had UNC in there, so that's a public university, and so the court wanted to pair these together, I think, in order to say this isn't just about private, it's not about public, it's a broader thing. But UNC is the flagship state university in North Carolina. And I think what you're dealing with here is a question of the institutions that our society uses to mark certain people as kind of the leadership of the future, will those institutions have these tools in order to kind of jigger the entering classes according to certain racial and ethnic criteria so that they sort of vaguely reflect the demographic breakdown of the country as a whole. And the court is effectively saying, no, you can't do that about race. And although I think that that's a very significant issue, we do have to keep in mind that the irony of always talking about it in terms of, but we're building an egalitarian society. How can we do that if we don't help Black Americans to get a leg up to compensate for the terrible disadvantages that come to them from the history of slavery and Jim Crow and other forms of racism embedded in the system. But it's not really about egalitarianism. It has to do with the look of the people who will be our leadership, the elites of our future. And so there's a real contradiction there. I mean, Harvard could absolutely admit 
a lot more black students without an affirmative action program if it simply got rid of legacy admissions, if it stopped giving huge advantage to the whatever it is, 30, 40 percent of each entering class whose parents or grandparents went to Harvard, who usually were white. And there are, you know, parallel, although not quite as drastic versions of this, even at state schools like UNC. So I do think it's important to to keep in mind that there's at least a tension there between the supposed egalitarian aims of affirmative action and the kind of area of American life in which we use it most aggressively, which is college admissions. Bob Schramm, even in liberal California, voters rejected a referendum that would have reinstated race-based preferences in education by 57% in 2020. I understand you support the idea of affirmative action, but isn't there a lot of gainsmanship going on here? I mean, as Damon hinted, a lot of this is about competition among people who are already elite. You know, two black Harvard law professors, Lonnie Guinier and Henry Louis Gates Jr., pointed out a long time ago, 2004, that at that time, somewhere between a half and two thirds of the black Harvard students were West Indian and African immigrants or their children, and to a lesser extent, the children of biracial couples. And, you know, there's been other data that shows that these tend to be kids who come from wealthier families, your chances of getting to Harvard if you come from a truly disadvantaged background are actually not good, no matter what your race. And then there's the case of, you know, Matt Iglesias, and he's written about this himself. I'm not outing him, but he says, you know, look, he had three grandparents of Eastern European Jewish descent, and he had one grandparent from Cuba. But that gave him a leg up getting into Harvard. Uh, Well, I think all of that's true, uh, but it's not, for me, a reason to throw out the baby with the bathwater. It's a reason why schools should be more careful in how they apply this. One of the things that's interesting in California is that, for example, in the University of California system, you now have more people of color admitted than you did before affirmative action was initially outlawed in 1996. And that's because, to go back to the point Steve made and I made earlier, there are other ways for universities to do this. You have to be very careful, as the pollster John Della Volpe from the Harvard Institute of Politics points out, how you report public opinion on this. Because the numbers you gave are from a Washington Post poll, I believe. And he says... No, I was quoting Pew, actually. Okay, Pew. Well, It's the same numbers, basically, 63% uh, favor abolishing it in the Washington Post poll. He says you get a very different response if you word the question differently and you ask whether voters support policies that consider experiences and perspectives of applicants, which may include their racial or ethnic background. That seems to be what Chief Justice Roberts is permitting. And that, I think, is what will now happen not everywhere. You know, Florida, Texas, it's not going to happen there in public institutions, but it will happen, I think, in a lot of bluer states, and it will happen with a lot of private universities. Steve, let's get your view on that, because uh, the Chief Justice said, yeah, in your essay, you can talk about how being a racial minority is something that affected you or inspired you or held you back or whatever. So as long as it's about you in particular and not you're just checking a box and saying, I belong to a particular racial or ethnic group. But do you think that if that becomes sort of de rigueur, that all minority students start writing essays talking about their ethnic backgrounds, do you think that that will pass muster with the court or will the court say, no, no, now you're just trying to get around our ruling? What do you think? I mean, I think that's the right question, Mona, and I wish I knew how to answer it. It's complicated in one other respect by the fact that there are at least some states, as Robert just mentioned, that have moved toward banning those kinds of diversity statements as part of, you know, applications at least to public colleges and universities. I live in one of them. And so I think the reality is that today's decision is not going to categorically end any consideration of race 
but it's also not going to end litigation about that because any school that does, you know, let students write those kinds of statements, I think is now going to be sued. And I think there's language in the chief justice's majority opinion that would open the door toward at least lower courts saying, actually, you can't do this. Just one other quick point about the polling and the data. I mean, one of the things that I've always found frustrating about this conversation and about the way these cases are argued legally is that, you know, one of the sort of largest blocks of admitted students at a school like Harvard is legacy and athlete admissions. I think the data is something like 43% of Harvard admits from the same year as the data that was used in this case were either legacy or athletes or both. And so it seems like, you know, we can all agree that the right answer here, that the solution is holistic review of individual files in cases where that's possible. But when it comes to just sort of how much the admissions process is being distorted by racial preferences, I think it is worth keeping in mind how the even at the schools that have the most aggressive racial preferences, the amount of impact that it has on admissions tends to pale in comparison to admitting, you know, the grandfather's grandchild or the, you know, third string linebacker. That's not to say that's bad, too. It's just, I think, also part of the story. Well, it is, except insofar as, look, how would you make an equal protection argument that that should not be lawful, right? No, no, I mean, Mona, this is my point. It's not that it's not lawful. It's that if the argument is that by having racial preferences, you are taking spots away from members of other racial minority groups or members of other disadvantaged groups, then I think the problem with that argument is that it presupposes that there's only one slice of the incoming class to which you can offer these kinds of seats, whereas it wouldn't have to be a zero-sum game in a universe in which you left it to universities to decide how to draw those percentages, because you could have, say, you know, we want to have a larger percentage of our incoming class be from underrepresented groups, and the way we're going to accomplish that is by having a smaller percentage of our incoming class be legacies or athletes. I went to a small liberal arts college. I went to Amherst. You know, that's been part of the calculus for especially small colleges going back generations now. I just think like that's a more, I think, fully fleshed out conversation than just if you give preferences to one racial group, you're harming other racial groups. I think that's just too simplistic. Mm. Well, I think we probably on this podcast anyway, we would all cheer if they got rid of legacy admissions. But let me ask you one other thing about the false scarcity here. Because wouldn't it be possible for these selective schools to just take in more students? I don't mean necessarily students living on campus, but they could do it online or some other way. I mean, don't we have an artificial scarcity here that's maintained by the universities for their own profits and their own reasons, but that actually doesn't serve society very well because there are a lot of highly qualified students who have to be turned away? You know, Mona, I, I'm sympathetic to that argument. I will say I'm not a higher education expert. I'm a, I'm a con law nerd. And I think <laughs> that the, the, the scarcity problem is one that, like the legacy problem, doesn't have constitutional dimensions. True. I will just say that in Texas, you know, it has been such a central part of our public university, especially the University of Texas systems approach, to try to ensure that there are seats for, you know, anyone who excels in their high school anywhere in Texas at one of our, you know, 36 public colleges and universities. I think that's an approach that is, you know, a very positive way of pursuing diversity, but not every state has the luxury of the kind of, you know, geographical diversity that Texas has. And so I think the question is whether we're better off with a uniform national rule or whether we're better off letting states have some variability in how they decide you know, not just the sizes of their universities, but the sort of the relative makeup of their universities. And, you know, just color me one who thinks this is one of those contexts where we would be better off leaving it to the states. Okay. With that, let us turn to a much less stable country than our own, <laughs> namely Russia. We all watched last weekend as an attempted coup seemed to be unfolding on Saturday with the private army that the militia that Putin had created, Wagner Group, that was doing his dirty work around the world, did turn around and march toward Moscow for a little while. And then there was a truce, and Koshenko of Belarus stepped in and negotiated a truce. But David Kramer, this really does 
tell us a lot of things about the state of Russia, doesn't it? And about Putin in particular. So tell us your takeaway. Well, Mona, I've been studying Russia either as an independent country or as part of the Soviet Union for three and a half decades or so. And I have to say, this is a bit of a bizarre situation where I am struggling to figure out what the hell is going on there. I think there's no doubt that Putin was weakened by this coup attempt, insurrection, mutiny, whatever term you want to use. And yet uh, how he responds to it, he may wind up consolidating his control, at least temporarily. There was frustration on Prigozhin's part, particularly with an order to subsume his forces under the Ministry of Defense, with whom he has been battling its leadership since last fall. And I think for Prigozhin, he worried this meant the end of the Wagner mercenaries as a independent force, even though it's not independent, as you rightly point out, it was funded by the Russian government, and that he would lose control. And so he was frankly pissed off with the defense minister, Shoigu, with the chief of the general staff, Gerasimov, and decided he had enough, voiced views that contradicted the official line of that justifies the invasion of Ukraine going back to 2022, and launched his troops northward. Oh, can you talk a little bit more about that? That was extraordinary because, you know, the Russian propagandists all this time since the invasion have been talking about how it was a defensive operation. NATO was about to attack with the aid of Ukraine and so on. And he just blew that out of the water, right? He did indeed. He basically said this was done for the wrong reasons, that it was driven by Defense Minister Shoigu and his efforts to boost his credentials, that the Ukrainians were not threatening Russians, and essentially dismissed the notion that they were Nazis that were running Ukraine, which has been the constant line of Putin and the propagandists that are on his side. And, and so Prigozhin also did undermine the official rhetoric and the official policy that explains and tries to justify why Putin ordered the invasion in February of last year. But Prigozhin has been bad-mouthing the Russian leadership for a while. And it was only recently that he started to hint at going after Putin himself. He had been careful up to, say, the past month or so, not going after Putin, tiptoeing up to that point. But he has just been blasting the defense ministry and others. And for other Russians who are not named Prigozhin, but are average citizens, who might voice some critical views or a man whose daughter posted something on social media critical of the invasion, they get arrested. They get thrown in prison. They have the full force of the law enforcement authorities come after them. And yet when the Prigozhin attacks rhetorically and then physically over the weekend, the military leadership all seems to be forgiven, at least for now, though I would not want to be holding the life insurance policy on Mr. Prigozhin. (laughs) He would be wrong to stumble toward any open windows. So now what about the other thing that this raises, the prospect of instability in Russia itself? You had Jen Stoltenberg, NATO's secretary general, saying Putin has lost the monopoly of force and unstable Russia becomes a risk. So how much should that be a concern? Obviously, it's always going to be a concern, but Well, I heard a phrase this morning from a friend and colleague, a Russia expert, Bobo Lowe, who described Putin as diminished but not finished. And I think that Mm. is a good way to capture what's happened here. Putin was challenged like he's never been before. Keep in mind that there are a few positions that Putin can appoint directly in the Russian leadership, and the Minister of Defense is one of them. Prigozhin's objective was to remove the Minister of Defense. If he had accomplished that, that would have totally undermined Putin's authority. As it is, the march toward Moscow, 200 kilometers outside of the city, when they finally stopped and turned around, as you indicated, with some intervention from the Belarusian dictator, Alexander Lukashenko, this was the biggest challenge Putin has faced in his 23 years in power. And how he deals with it will, I think, determine whether he is able to maintain his iron grip on power, or whether others will think that there is an opening here that they can take advantage of. 
I'm reluctant to use the 91 comparison when there was a, a failed coup attempt against Gorbachev in August of 91, because waiting in the wings from that was Boris Yeltsin. Yeltsin was the one who defended against that attempted coup. It was the Soviet communist hardliners who tried to launch it. I don't know who stands waiting in the wings to replace Putin. I think most of the people around him are too chicken to challenge him. And they saw what happened to Brigosian. Sergei Surovikin, who's a, a hawkish military general, has not been seen since this all unfolded. He may have been involved in some way. So people are still nervous and waiting to see how the chips fall. A friend of this podcast, Ann Applebaum, has said that it's actually tougher to do Kremlinology now than it was in the old USSR, because then at least there were people that you knew stood to uh, take power if the general secretary was deposed. But now there really is no way to know, right? Yeah, Anne's absolutely right. It's it's a black box. And before you could sort of look at the military parade and who was standing next to whom. And these days, Putin is usually at the end of a very long table, and everyone else is further down. Now, he also rather strangely went off to Dagestan, which is a republic in the southern part of Russia, uh, right next to Chechnya. He's been trying to show that he remains in control, and yet it just isn't clear what really is going on here. The propagandists, who sometimes are a weather vane of what's happening politically in Russia, seem rather confused about what line to take. Surovikin, for example, used to be popular among them. Now he no longer is. Prigozhin was never that popular because of his challenge to the Minister of Defense. But Putin has some real repair work to do. I wouldn't say that he is unable to do it. But a lot will be determined by what plays out in Ukraine. And here, I think, is where Putin is going to find himself even in a weaker position than he was, because I think this whole escapade will erode morale among Russian soldiers who are on the front line. And it was already pretty low as, to begin with. But they must be wondering, why the hell are we on the front lines here? Uh, on the receiving end of Ukrainian bullets and missiles when these guys can't get their act together in Moscow. I think it will also erode the morale among the Wagner mercenaries who were told by Prigozhin to march to Moscow, and then he suddenly told them to go in reverse. And uh, they may not be treated very well, depending on what plays out. But I think, on the contrary, what we're likely to see in Ukraine is a real boost in morale because the Ukrainians will feel that the Russians are rather preoccupied with their own political problems and not able to focus as much on the military campaign as it is. The Ukrainians have been on the counteroffensive. It's been moving slower than some would hope. But I think for the United States, the key is to worry less about what happens in Moscow and in the Kremlin and to focus on helping Ukraine win, not just as long as it takes, not just to help them to a negotiated solution to help them win, meaning defeating Russian forces, driving every Russian soldier off Ukrainian territory. And if we provide them with the attackums and F-16s, I wish we had done it much sooner, I think Ukraine can achieve victory. One last question. Does Putin's conduct in this crisis suggest something about his bravado and his tendency to make empty threats? I mean, people, including very important decision makers in the administration, have arguably been very worried about provoking Putin and about his capacity to escalate to nuclear war. And yet in this crisis, he backed down, arguably, when push came to shove. Should we learn something from that or is that too far? No, I think you're spot on, Mona. And, and it isn't just in this weekend that we've seen this. The Russian uh, officials have drawn numerous red lines during this entire year and a half, where they said if the West provided military assistance to Ukraine, we would be crossing a red line. Well, guess what? We provided military assistance. They haven't done anything to us. They said if we provide HIMARS, which is a, an advanced missile system, that that would be crossing a red line. If Finland and Sweden were allowed to enter into NATO, Sweden's not yet in, Finland is, that would be a red line we'd cross. On and on and on, Putin and his acolytes have been drawing red lines, and they just keep getting wiped out, and there are no consequences. 
I think the, all the talk about use of tactical nuclear weapons, moving some of them to Belarus, is mainly designed to try to get us to back off supporting Ukraine. You can't completely rule out and dismiss the possibility of use of a tactical nuclear weapon. You have to be mindful, for example, that they might cause some terrorist incident at the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. But I think the use of a tactical nuclear weapon is extremely low. The likelihood is very, very low. But it's mostly designed to get us to worry about the risk of escalation. And it's had some impact. As you rightly point out, that's been the view of some in the, in the Biden administration. We should stay focused on helping Ukraine win. And I don't think that the use of a tactical nuclear weapon is likely. I'm not sure the Russian military at this point, and I believe this even before this weekend, would follow through on such an order if Putin were to give one. So even blowing up the Zaporizhia nuclear plant, depending on which way the winds are blowing at the time, that may cause hell of a lot more damage and havoc for Russia than it would for Ukraine. So both of those steps have numerous downsides that I think make it unlikely. And so we just need to stay focused on what our objectives are. And it's a reminder, President Biden really needs to go out and explain to the American people why supporting Ukraine serves U.S. national interests and explain what our objectives are. And I would hope that those objectives are very much focused on Ukrainian victory. Thank you for that. All right. With that, it is time for our final segment, your, our highlight or low light of the week. And I'm going to turn first to Steve Vladek because he has another appointment he has to get to. So, Steve Vladek. Can my highlight and the light both be the Supreme Court? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, Mona, I, th- I think that to me is that this term, I think, looks a lot more like the court many of us expected, where you have you know decisions that are generally favorable to the conservative justices, but where you actually see daylight between the you know middle of the court, at least the median justices, Chief Justice Roberts and Justices Barrett and Kavanaugh on the one hand, and Thomas Alito and Gorsuch on the other. And so my highlight is the sort of reassertion of that divide in cases like Moore versus Harper and a case from last week called U.S. versus Texas. I guess my low light is the sort of blurring over that divide in the affirmative action case in a way that's going to cause mischief going forward as opposed to a clear rule one way or the other. So the Supreme Court, as only it can, well, it and the New York Mets being both in the positive and negative categories for me this week. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Next, we will hear from David Kramer. I would say the low light was what happened in Russia uh, over the past week, where we see more chaos and infighting among Russian forces and Prigozhin versus Putin and Shoigu and Gerasimov. The highlight remains Ukraine. I think Ukraine remains an inspiration to uh, everyone in the world, not just here in the United States, as stalwart defenders of their country, their freedom their lives for that matter. And we have a NATO summit coming up in less than two weeks. I hope NATO will recognize the sacrifices Ukraine has made and provide a clear path to membership, which Ukrainians strongly, strongly support. And I think Ukraine very much deserves. Frankly, at this point, I would say NATO would be lucky to have Ukraine as a member and let's not give Russia a de facto veto of Ukraine's aspirations. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. All right. Robert Trump. Well, my highlight, and I say this despite the fact that Steve is right and that the federal courts could do another Bush v. Gore, which, given my involvement in the Gore campaign, was a very painful experience. I think the more ruling rejecting the independent state legislature theory was the highlight. If the court had gone the other way, you could have state legislatures in 2024 saying, look, we are suspicious of some of the ballots that were cast in the presidential election, so we're just going to award our electors to the person who apparently lost, but we think actually won. And I think that would have been a fundamental threat to democracy, and we have avoided that. My highlight of the week, I think, would be the continuing strength of the American economy. All the predictions of recession, which we were hearing for months seem untrue. I mean, you can't know the future, but they seem untrue right now. And we see inflation coming down. And I think over time, that will have an impact on the mood of the country, on the way voters feel, and on 
what happens in the next presidential campaign. You could throw in that the murder rate is trending down too. <laughs> Crime rates are trending down. That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Damon Linker. Well, my choice of a sort of blended highlight or low light this week you know, is a small story in some respects, but it's, a, I think, a worthwhile lens into trends on the right. Someone I, I bet most of uh, our listeners have never heard of, a guy named Pedro Gonzalez, who is uh, someone I don't enjoy encountering on Twitter. He's an overwhelmingly nasty guy. He's one of these kind of young people on the right who spend all of his time on Twitter insulting anyone who's to the right of the most rightward member of the House Caucus. That's sort of his MO. His day job is to be a politics editor at the paleoconservative Chronicles magazine. So a nasty guy. He kind of became known on the right during the, the last two years of the Trump administration, again, as a kind of vociferous attack dog for uh, anyone who dared to cross Trump. But over the last Last six months or so, he's flipped to being a rabid DeSantis supporter and now spends a lot of his time attacking Trump and people who still love Trump. And apparently the Trump folks have been able to try to seek revenge against this guy by working on a kind of oppo dump against him for Breitbart News, which ran a long piece about him this week that was based uh, entirely on private text messages that this guy Gonzalez sent to friends of his on the right back around 2019, 2020, in which it became incredibly clear that what people like me thought about Gonzalez suspected was true or is in fact true, that he's a raving anti-Semite and a racist. And he said overtly racist and anti-Semitic things in this forum, which has now been published. The interesting thing about this is not really that that's who this obscure guy is, but the response by most people on the online right have been to rally around him. I know one of the big packs for the DeSantis campaign has tried to distance itself from him. But the DeSantis campaign itself, as far as I know, hasn't uh, made any kind of statement or distanced itself from him and his support. And a lot of fairly prominent people on, you could say, the Federalist faction, meaning the website, have sort of rallied to his side, asked for him to receive grace, even though he admits that the things he said were stupid. But you realize what he's really saying is that him saying these things was stupid because he got caught. So so, you know, this gives us, again, a, a view of the kinds of people who are being attracted to the right these days and the kinds of thoughts that animate their political engagement. And finally, I think it's a sign of something we're going to see a lot more of, because remember, the DeSantis and Trump factions were once just the Trump faction on the right. And now that those camps are at war with each other, there were people on the other side of that conversation who shared those text messages. I think they're going to be some people in the Trump camp who also get hit by these kind of oppo dumps. But in the end, will anybody care? Probably not, because they're all pretty much okay with that way of looking at the world. And here we are in 2023 on the right. All right. Thank you for that, Damon. I was going to cite more v. Harper, although I had a backup because I suspected that's at least one other person on this podcast might also cite that as a highlight of the week. And so I am going to praise tentatively because I haven't finished the book yet, but I am reading Russia, Revolution and Civil War, 1917 to 1921 by Antony Beaver. Came out in 2022, I believe. And this is a history, as you can tell, of a very short period of time, but he has really done his research and it is just incredibly enlightening and has a lot of lessons for us for today. Just the will to power, the disregard of norms and traditions, you know, and his depiction of that world, in some ways it's radically different from our own and in other ways eerily similar. Human beings are still human beings and the level of violence is just unbelievable. You know, it's largely been forgotten because of the mass slaughter of World War II, but that came later, obviously. But the level of violence on both sides in the Russian Revolution and Civil War is astounding. So I recommend it. 
Antony Beaver, Russia, Revolution, and Civil War. With that, I want to thank our three guests today, Bob Shrum, David Kramer, and Steve Vladek. Thank you so much for helping to enlighten us this week. Also want to thank our producer, Katie Cooper, our sound engineer, Jonathan Siri, and our editor, Aaron Keene. And we will return next week as every week. The Bulwark Podcast focuses on political analysis and reporting without partisan loyalties. A real sense of deja vu sprinkled on our PTSD. So things are going well, I guess. Every Monday through Friday, Charlie Sykes speaks with guests about the latest stories from inside Washington and around the world. You document in a very compelling way all of the positive things that have come out of this, but it also feels like we have this massive hangover. No shouting or grandstanding. Principles over partisanship. The Bulwark Podcast, wherever you listen.